Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight on Blue Books, I drink gin from a brandy glass. So I am drinking gin because I just went to the dentist and he did something to affect the porosity of my teeth and advised me to only drink clear fluids and eat white food for the next 24 hours. You've got to be one of those people who goes on their book video and doesn't talk about books, but I do just have to tell you, have you seen that episode of Friends where the doctor is obsessed with the Fonzie? Yeah, it was just a bit like that. He had the Whitney Houston greatest hits playing the whole time. So it's an hour's appointment and he played Whitney Houston for the whole hour and uh, at one point he said, thank heavens for Whitney Houston. But what I was really going to say was that while I was waiting to go to the dentist, I went to a Waterstones and I don't really like Waterstones as a bookshop. They're, they're just a little bit soulless and they're a little bit commercial and, and the real test, the real, the World Water Benchmark? Watermark? Water post? Water bench? Water gauge. Water gauge. Is that a thing? The water gauge. The real water gauge for me. That's not a thing, is it? The real water gauge for me is that um, I, when I go into water stains, I very rarely buy anything, and it's very very hard for me to go into a bookshop and not buy something normally. Anyway, so there's this little water stains there, and it had lovely books. It was really nicely set out and I had to buy a book. In fact, I actually bought two books. And the woman that was in the shop, every time everyone, there was about three people waiting to pay when I went to pay, and she'd read all of the books. It just reminded me of that um, Goodwill Hunting quote where he says, uh, you just paid a hundred grand for an education that you could have got for a buck and a half in late fees at the public library. You know, she, she just, she had she had read all the classics and she had read them all by, by working in the bookshop. And I just think there's kind of something pure and wonderful about that. And I bought a Jeanette Winterson book called Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, which I've never read, even though I know it's very famous. In fact, it's a book that John Travolta is reading when he gets killed by Bruce Willis in Pulp Fiction, like really incongruously. You know, they, he comes out of the toilet, Bruce Willis looks down at the book, and then he, he kills him. I really love the last Jeanette Winterson book I've read, which is called Sex in the Cherry, and it's really fabulous, and I recommend it. And... I just, I love, I loved, I, I mean, I read the introduction, which is written by her, and how can you not, how can you just not buy this? The title is attributed to me by Nell Gwynn, raunchy mistress of Charles I, possessor of fabulous breasts, who was famously painted as an orange seller. I thought she might have said oranges are not the only fruit, but she didn't. But what's the point of being a fiction writer if you can't make things up? My sister actually met Jeanette Winterson because um, she lives in Spitalfields. She lives half in Cotswolds, in the Cotswolds, and half in Spitalfields. And uh, she said she was quite grumpy, but um, but but nice. Not, people can be nice and grumpy. I'm one of those rare people who's just nice, which is <laughs> nice. People often have a grumpy side. All children, famous children's authors have this like, I don't really like children anecdote about them. Did you know that Roald Dahl wrote the Gremlins? I knew that, it's just one of the many facts that I know. Just know it. Based on um, fighter pilot stories from Japan. Based on fighter pilot stories. Just another thing that I know. I'm going to cut you out of this, so... I know. <laughs> no one will know that you just... You're my fact, he's the thief. F. Scott Fitzgerald was particularly partial to gin. He liked uh, gin and lime. James Bond drank gin martinis, but I don't think Ian Fleming drank gin. He was famously advised to switch to bourbon. I thought that Bond drank gin. What? He wrote the one in the play. What? No, he didn't. Well, he wrote the f screenplay for the film. Yes, I mean, but that's about to find the book, obviously. It's bugger all like the book. Have you right. ever read the book? Okay. What I find ridiculous is that Roald Dahl was really vehement about the film adaptations of his stories, especially Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, because they so wildly changed his book. And yet he's got no fucking qualms at all about doing it to Ian Fleming. It was a huge box office success, so he probably feels like it. Well, so was Johnny and the Juggler Factory. Reading should be an adventure. Adventures are about the unknown. When I started to read seriously, I was excited and comforted all at the same time. 
the literature should be a mix of unfamiliarity and recognition. Into the heart of anguish we never felt and crimes we could not commit. You'd buy this, wouldn't you? I bought it, so would you buy it? I would. I did. Here it is. I think, I, I think it's very hard not to buy that book. If you're like me, then when you hear booktube videos or um, radio interviews or book programmes on, on TV or on the radio. This is a fun game that you can play at home if you're incredibly narcissistic. Watch this programme or this podcast and uh, mute all the bits where the author talks and then talk yourself. I do it a lot and I really just come across so well. Radio 4 is really missing out by not employing me. Hello, we're welcoming the new year in with warning sirens instead of bells as we delve into a precarious future. Are we entering a new golden age of dystopian fiction? Dystopian fiction, that's a really interesting idea, isn't it? You know, it's, it's that kind of projected negativity. It's all of our fears solidified into some kind of exaggeration. We've got quite a lot of dystopian fiction. Clockwork Orange, and we've got Handmaid's Tale. I think there should be a non-threatening, non-sexual way to say, I would like to be friends with you. I am happily in a relationship, but it would be nice if we were friends. And we've got 1984. And we've got, what we got? We've got Annihilation. I really, really like Bulgakov because it's highbrow writing. You know, there's a lot of kind of poor intellectuals in Russia. Um, and it's a really vicious satire, but it's really funny. It's, they're, they're clever, funny, witty stories. Very long, I mean, so optimism isn't a big feature. It's a lot of dystopia that Greg's just described that attracted you. Luke? I think it was, I mean, um, my, my, my novel is set probably just about ten years into the future, so it's a really near at hand. Nobody really talks like that, do they? I mean, you call me posh, but I don't talk like that. I think it was, I mean, um, my, my, my novel is set probably just about ten years into the future. But he always sounds like a normal person, and then he kind of flutes into something ridiculous. I think what my novel is said. Uh, I think part of the problem is that nobody really knows how society is supposed to run, and it clearly doesn't run perfectly. And everyone, for thousands of years, has been hypothesising the best way to get it to run. Look at this. Plato's The Republic. His mouthpiece is Socrates, so it's Socrates that comes up with all the good ideas. But Socrates famously didn't believe in writing anything down. He thought that you should learn all of your wisdom from talking to people. So Plato, his greatest student, broke his biggest commandment by writing everything down. And not only did he write everything down, he wrote everything down and he said Socrates said it. So you don't really know what Socrates actually said and what Plato actually said. But he has this strange idea about organising people by metals. So people are classified into gold and iron and the gold people get taught to be the leaders and the iron people get taught to be the warriors and the silver people. I don't, I don't really remember it, but it's very interesting. Yeah, but let's say you were immortal, then you were in charge of everything. Do you think you could do a good job? Why not? Where do the elves go in the end of Lord of the Rings? Yeah, but what's actually there? I mean, the dwarf of the immortal. so they live in the forest and they have feasts and they sing songs and they live forever. But their heaven is that they get to go off somewhere and live forever. So what the hell's the difference? So the difference between their heaven and their Middle Earth experience is nothing. It's just like we get a recharge. So children of humans and elves can live forever. Well, if the bloodline can't be polluted, then that would mean anyone who has any elfish ancestry would live forever. I like a badass in a dystopian novel. That's what I like. I like a Mad Max type character. I don't care how dystopian it is or how depressing it is, as long as there's someone there, probably in a leather jacket and boots, who has a gun and like kicks some ass. I probably should go to bed. Good night.